So when I became a new father, I suddenly found myself having to watch a lot of kids' TV shows. You kidding me, sir? Fine, fine, you called me out. I'm an overgrown man-child who never stopped watching kids' TV shows. But a couple of times I've tried to get my son interested in the shows that I liked as a kid with very mixed results. He just really seems to prefer the shows that were made for his generation. Well, duh. And to be fair, even though Gen Xers like myself love to complain about how our cartoons are way better than any of the cartoons they have today, I do have to admit that cartoons today are actually pretty good, especially when it comes to sneaking in educational and socially relevant content. And yeah, it can be kind of transparent when they try to shoehorn in a new character to make sure that all genders, ethnicities, levels of ability, etc. are represented. But they have to start somewhere, and I for one am glad that they're doing it. It means that this will be the norm for future generations. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. No, today I'm actually just here to waste your time by reminiscing about a show that probably couldn't exist today, and which frankly I'm kind of surprised even got made back when I was a kid. Yes, yes, we've done that joke before. Ha ha, I'm old. If you had Nickelodeon back in the 1980s, I know you watched You Can't Do That on Television. Don't even try to lie about it. But for those of you who didn't have cable, or who grew up after the show had already been taken off the air, or who maybe just blocked it from your memories, let's take a look back on why you could do that on television, but definitely can't anymore. Okay, for the incognoscenti, here is a brief explanation of a little show called You Can't Do That on Television. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. It was basically just a sketch comedy show featuring a revolving cast of kids, uh, usually about six to eight different kids per episode, ranging in ages from about eight to maybe about 17. All of the adult roles were played by two immensely talented and underrated actors. Abby Haggard, who played all the ladies, and Les Lai, who played at least 15 different recurring characters, including the father, Lance Prevert, and the teacher, Mr. Schittler. I mean, look at that name, especially paired with that mustache, and then tell me this was appropriate for a kid's show. The whole thing was sort of a metafictional show within a show, which had the kids playing themselves on the set of a TV show, while also performing in the sketches. Each episode had a different theme, like money or popularity, but despite the different theme and the revolving cast members, each episode had some very similar features. There were the opposite sketches, the locker jokes, and of course the hallmark water and green slime that would drop down on anyone who said water or I don't know, respectively. There was also a relatively large but still limited number of settings for the sketches, including a living room, a dining room, a classroom, a school bus, and a video arcade, among others. But now we're starting to get into why this show wouldn't fly today due to its dark and sinister nature. A lot of the sketches took place in a dungeon, where the kids were shown chained to the wall and frequently threatened with, or even actually subjected to, torture. Ow! Oh, come on! Cut it out! That's torture! That hurts! <laughs> and apparently, right outside the dungeon was the execution ground, where the kids would face the firing squad for trivial offenses. Of course, the kids were rarely shown being shot, although it did happen on occasion. More often, the sketch would end one second before the squad opened fire, or the kid would trick the leader of the firing squad into getting shot in their place. Basically, the best possible outcome of these sketches was that the kid tricked an adult into being shot to death. You know, nice, light, after-school entertainment. Even sketches that took place in relatively mundane locations, such as the school, often featured the detention room where, again, a kid was often seen chained to the wall in the background, and kids were again given outlandish punishments for minor offenses. 
But the most horrific scenes by far took place inside Barth's Burgers, where the kids were routinely subjected to absolutely disgusting meals. Most skits in Barth's ended with the kids puking like white girls at Mardi Gras once they found out what Barth had been putting in their food, a list that included sewage, vomit, cockroaches, rats, and dead pets. A few sketches even ended with one or more of the kids dying of food poisoning right in the booth, where it was not only suggested, but outright stated that their corpses would soon end up on Barth's menu. Back. <laughs> I guess we won't be hearing from him anymore. <laughs> no, no, but we'll be tasting him for many weeks to come. Who do you think's in the burgers? I heard that. <laughs> oh, Barth! <laughs> And hey, I'm not too proud to admit that I had at least one Barth-related nightmare as a kid, and I doubt I'm the only one. I dropped the Barth! <laughs> so why did we let them get away with this? Why weren't people more outraged? Well, first and foremost, because it was funny. It was funny as hell. And also, it was deliberately subversive. And I think adults tend to underestimate children's ability to appreciate satire. We got the joke. We knew that this show was funny because it was the exact opposite of wholesome educational TV. Rumor has it, Mr. Rogers hated this show, and not without reason. Mr. Rogers, neighborhood pusher, will not be seen today. But frankly, I never saw anything that was really harmful in You Can't Do That on Television. Sure, it wasn't exactly educational, but it treated the young audience with a great deal of respect. It didn't pander, it didn't condescend, it wasn't even trying to sell anything, and if you remember kids TV in the 80s, you knew that most shows were really just glorified toy commercials. If Mr. Rogers was like our parents, you know, loving, nurturing, and always looking out for our best interests, then You Can't Do That on Television was like the cool uncle who treated us like an equal and let us feel a little bit more like an adult, like actual people with identities separate from those of our parents, and I think that's good for child development. When it comes down to it, the darker aspects of the show actually did two very important things for a kid's audience. First, it validated a lot of the fears that a lot of kids have, but in such a ridiculous way that it let us laugh at them a little. Hey, aren't you as scared of my hypodermic needle? No. Uh, what's the matter, you stupid? Yeah. Oh. When you're a kid, it feels like every mistake you make is going to land you in a dungeon, or in front of a firing squad or that even something like detention can turn into some cruel and unusual form of punishment. But when those fears get turned into the subjects of jokes, and jokes that are made for you to laugh at, not for others to laugh at you, then it really eases the mind and it makes those fears easier to deal with. Second, a lot of the sketches on the show were kind of a form of wish fulfillment. When the kids on the show lost a battle, the kids in the audience could commiserate. Trust me, kids are used to the idea of losing at the hands of adults. Do you eat all these Brussels sprouts? And I mean all of these Brussels sprouts. You will go to your room, you will clean it up, you will do your homework, you will write a thank you letter to your great aunt. Like this, you will write, who needs enemies? You will rake cat, you will paint the garbage. Now eat! But on those occasions when the kids outsmarted the adults and won, it was fun for us to watch. It showed us that we weren't always powerless. The kids on this show lost more often than they won just like in real life. But they did win sometimes, and that made their victories somehow sweeter, rather than in those shows where the kids are always smart, always perfect, and always win the day. In the final analysis, though, I'm probably reading way too much into this. I have no idea if any of this actually went through the writers' heads, or if they were just trying to make a funny show that kids would like. But one thing I am sure of, though, is that this show belongs to a bygone era. And although progress is great, it's also a little sad when certain things get left behind. This show was a major hit in the 1980s, and now I can't even find complete seasons of it on DVD or on any streaming or on-demand platform. Just a couple of old videotaped episodes that got uploaded online, and that's why the clips that I'm using are such poor quality. Now, I'm sure that this will probably be re-released at some point in the future. Our demand for kitschy nostalgia is insatiable. But even if I found it, I doubt my son would enjoy it nearly as much as I did as a kid. I think it's just an idea whose time has passed and whose purpose has been served. The title of the show, Once Ironic, is now sadly prophetic. Today, you truly can't do that on television.
Okay, enough with all the maudlin crap. It is just way too nice a day out here for that. So are you a fan of You Can't Do That on Television? Share your thoughts with me here in the comments. And although we talked a lot about things you can't do on television, allow me to point out two things you can do here on YouTube. Hit those like and subscribe buttons. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I think it turned out well, and I had fun making it. If you didn't like it, uh, I, mean, I don't know what to tell you. It's... Uh, oh! Oh! Oh, that's terrible! Oh! Oh, that is gross. Oh, I really asked for that, didn't... Oh! God! Where is this coming from? Oh. Okay, I'm beginning to see why this show went off the air. This is bad.